The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to two experts on copyright law, attorney Ed Greenberg and commercial photographer Jack Resnicki. They've just published the second edition of The Copyright Zone, a legal guide for photographers and artists in the digital age. Stick around. You and I both know this isn't as, ex as exciting as having Raquel Welch as a guest, but let's not tell them that, okay? <laughs> So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media Interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of impoverished artists and photographers who think copywriting their work is a waste of time and money in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. As a writer and podcast host, I'm a strong believer in protecting my intellectual property rights and exploiting them for every penny that they're worth. That's how I make my living, quite frankly. And in my line of work, I'm always in situations where I'm collaborating with artists and photographers. Unfortunately, many of them over the years have treated the rights to their work as a burden rather than a potential source of endless income. The way I see it, once I create a work, whether it's a book, a magazine article, or even a podcast like this, I expect it to be an earner for the rest of my life. A little here, a little there, pretty soon it all adds up. And that's the reason why I thought it would be interesting and educational to invite Ed Greenberg and commercial photographer Jack Resnicki to come on the show and talk about the finer points found in their new book, The Copyright Zone, a legal guide for photographers and artists in the digital age. If you are an artist or a photographer, or know someone who is, this is going to be a very interesting show. Ed Greenberg and Jack Resnicki, welcome to Mr. Media. Hello there. Thank you very much. Guys, glad to have you here. Very interesting subject for me. And, I mean, it takes a, a certain kind of mind to be creative and productive. Not necessarily the same person, though, who wants to fill their head with legalities. Am I, am I correct? Um, yeah, but it's it's a thing that I, I ask photographers all the time when we do audiences and talk to them. How many people in the audience uh, insure their cameras? And you know, just everybody raises their hand. And we say, how many people insure their images? And what we find out is they don't know what to do. And I say, well, registering your copyright at the copyright office is image insurance, and it's worth a lot more. A camera I can replace easily. That's why I got the insurance. But when my images get ripped off, I mean, it, it's, you get nuts. Uh, people say you feel violated. It's, uh, it's not important because it happens to somebody else. But when it happens to you, it's a different story. In, in real life, if you're an artist, whether you're a comedian, an actor, a graphic designer, illustrator, or photographer, you can't do your art and put food on the table unless you make money and are properly compensated for your work. 
So one of the cliches or some of the cliches that we don't even permit in any of our seminars to be used is starving artist or impoverished. If you're impoverished and you're a starving artist, well, then it may be partly your own fault because you're not treating your art as a business. Now, I've represented very, very famous people like Richard Avedon down to photographers who's no, who no one's ever heard of and everything in between. The people who make money, the people who are successful, whether they're illustrators like uh, Anita Coons who does magazine covers uh, or photographers are the people who treat their art like a business. And if they don't treat it like a business and treat their creative works as assets and police them, uh, they will be flipping burgers and won't have the opportunity to be doing anything that they truly love. And one of the other things is we keep hearing, oh, I don't shoot fancy schmancy pictures. You know, my pictures are just, sometimes those are the most valuable. We, we've had, uh, well, Ev's had a case um, where somebody had a photo where if you looked at it, you'd say, eh, it's not a fancy schmancy picture. It's, it's uh, not much of anything. It's a guy with some uh, hay bales and, and mm -hmm. not a great wall. It's a photo is all you could say. Well, that photo probably brought that photographer um, uh, quite an income. We've had copyright image cases which concerned photographs of Bo Jackson and photographs of rapper Rick Ross and other famous people. And then there are cases of photographs of objects that are in public parks that you see every day, that there are five, as many as 5,000 images every day taken of those objects, utterly boring nothing photographs where those infringements have realized for the photographer hundreds of thousands of dollars because they registered the work. Some of the most successful photographs, financially successful photographs, are utterly mundane and boring. A photograph of a wave which appeared on Aquafina uh, uh, vending machines it was an extremely profitable image. So, uh, and as one of my adversaries told me decades ago, some of the most successful ad campaigns have been run on, frankly, crappy photography. Hmm. Nobody cares about the quality of a photography in an ad. What matters is whether or not the ad and the model, if there is a model being used in the ad, moves or sells the product, period. One of the things that a lot of artists and photographers and writers, for that matter, lose track of, you may only have that one really successful piece that you generate in a lifetime. Hopefully not, uh, but if, if you have one photo... Uh, I mean, think of a photo that 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 uh, everybody knows the, the the Vietnam photo of the little girl running through the street, or oh, the, uh, yeah, or on VE Day or VJ Day, whatever it was, the guy mm -hmm. kissing the, the the girl, and I mean, I shot, single yeah. photos, right? That make a you could. I'll give you live your uh, life on that. I'll give you a current example. One of our clients, Gary Miller took the photograph of Tupac Shakur the first time that they try to kill him, where he's flipping the bird to the camera. We have over the last, that photograph was taken in 1994, and we've made uh, over 70 claims and uh, numerous lawsuits for infringements uh, on that image for a period of over 20 years. I have several cases where the images that have been infringed are 20 and 30 years old, and every X number of months, we know there's going to be another infringement. But it doesn't have to be one of those fancy schmancy pictures that you're saying are iconic pictures. I, Ed um, successfully negotiated a settlement with somebody who infringed one of my pictures for five figures that was a real nothing shot. It's, it's something I can't talk about it because of the settlement um, terms, but it was a shot that's probably photographed by tourists 50 or 100 times a day, every day. We also we go into this in the book and, in our, and on our blog, the copyrightzone.com. There are many shots that were, at the time they're taken, no one could possibly know whether or not they would have any value. So my favorite example, I've just over the years had lots of Britney Spears cases and they relate to Britney Spears. And one of the cases concerns my client uh, who took a photograph of Britney when she was 12 years old at a wedding before she was Britney Spears. That image was infringed years later when she became Britney Spears. At the time the wedding photographer took that shot, there was no way that he could know that 10 years from now, this image would be in demand from all kinds of media sources and worth a substantial amount of money. You never know. 
And we have at least a dozen examples that we use in our seminars of you never know. Yeah, one of them, a lot of them are from weddings too, because some of the wedding pictures people think, oh, it's just another wedding, it's a bunch of people. Ed has some great stories. The one I love is the guy who paid a lot of money to the photographer to secure all the images. Yeah. Because he was there with somebody he wasn't supposed to. Um, <laughs> he was a uh, he was a he was a made man, and he went to a wedding, and he wasn't terribly bright and didn't think about the fact that during this wedding there'd be uh, a few hundred pictures of him with his guma, and uh, the bell went off in his head, and he made a very very generous payment to the photographer to buy the entire take. And he paid the bride and groom a nice piece of change to have him taken out of the images. Uh, we've had situations in, in one of the cases where the uh, photograph at a wedding showed someone who was on America's Most Wanted. Showed up <laughs> at a wedding. Uh, there are about 10 or 12 examples in the book where wedding photos turn into become that will become valuable, having nothing to do with the wedding, but because time and events have transformed the importance of the image. One last example, the bride, a stunning bride, a few months after the wedding, is arrested for having sex with her junior high school students. Her okay. wedding pictures become valuable, not as wedding pictures per se, but here's this beautiful woman at her storybook wedding, and three months later, she's sleeping with 14-year-old boys. Wow. Who oh, no. knew? Who knew? Well, it doesn't say much for her husband either. Um, so, uh, <laughs> now one of the one of the biggest sections of the book, I think, I, I didn't count the pages, but it just felt to me, is the section on registering your your work, um, and this Absolutely. seems to be what you're talking about. So, let, let's just jump to that and talk about how different. It's really hard to register and protect your work, right? That's Excuse why you me? do it. It's so difficult to do. It is so easy that. I teach my nine year my, my clients nine year old children how to do it. Any any anybody can do it, and the excuse that it's difficult or that you need a lawyer is just bogus. Or uh, that you have to pay somebody else. It's for so it. easy that Jack can teach people how to do it. So how <laughs> difficult can it be? Well, in the book we do screen by screen, but we got to back up a little bit and explain um, a couple things that really confuses a lot of people. One is. You own the copyright from the moment you take the picture. You, it, it is for any artist. If you put paint to canvas, if you, when you write something, as you write the words, as I snap the shutter, because of the 1978 law, I now own the image uh, as I photograph it, um, which is a big important thing. So I have the copyright immediately. However, drum roll please. This is the big part. Without registering it at the copyright office, is I like to say, it's worth a bucket of spit. Um, not really. It, it's the limitations of what you can do to protect your copyright if it's not registered is is pretty small. First of all, you cannot file a suit. You cannot file a copyright suit without the registration. Um, that's critically important. Um, and what happens is. Uh, and we go over this many times, a lot of um, lawyers and a lot of companies know if they don't see the registration, if you don't tell them this is a registered image, they'll just put you off. They, they know they can ignore they you. They ignore you forever because 90, literally 98% of all photographers and illustrators don't follow up and don't do anything. They like to become, unfortunately, many times victims. They get a lawyer's letter from the other side and we... One of our most popular columns, which we incorporate into the book about head fakes, it's a lawyer's trick. The lawyer for the infringer writes them a letter, gives them some bogus excuse, and the photographer slinks away with his tail between his legs because, gee, he's gotten a lawyer's letter that says that the infringer was totally justified. You know, well, it's fair use. Yeah, or fair use. And That's another one that they like to throw out that is rarely uh, applicable. And the, the irony is, is that while most laymen think lawyers lie all the time, a photographer gets a letter from a lawyer who's being paid by the bad guy. They get the letter, and voila, the photographer foolishly and naively believes it, <laughs> and they go away. 
And then they can bitch to their friends, gee, they ripped me off and they want to play victim. We don't, we don't cater to and we don't want our brethren and our comrades, whether they're illustrators or photographers, to become victims. Greenberg, if you want to be a victim, folks. don't read the book. <laughs> but let me, let me go jump again back to registration. Okay. Another factoid, as we call it, people get confused about. They say, oh, it's too expensive. Um, the price did go up um, this past summer, but it's $55 currently per application. Repeat. Not per photo. So per application means I've registered 10,000, 13,000 images on one application for $55. Now, Jack has said that. He said that in a crystal clear way. It came from a layman, not an attorney. We do this and we do shows like yours and seminars weekly. We have a common week. Even though Jack said it in absolutely plain language, it will be misunderstood. Somebody out there will tell a friend it's $55 a photo. It's not. And, and it, you're right. I mean, it's simple things like that. I mean, is it, is it just a, is an occupational hazard for these men and women that they, they just think, I'm a creative person, I, I don't Yeah, it's, yeah right? it's, tribal, it's tribal knowledge. And here's, uh, and I've, I've done this little spiel here a thousand, at least a thousand times. Photographers have a tendency to ask other photographers for legal advice, which is illogical. They don't ask photographers for dental advice. They don't ask them for, uh, you know, if they need a uh, podiatrist, they don't ask for a photographer to do, uh, you know, uh, any podiatry uh, work. But when it comes to the law, unlike plumbers, carpenters, and any other uh, artisans, they call other photographers for legal advice. Most of the legal advice that's out there on the web is put out there by people whose sole qualification is that they own a keyboard. So photographers, because of a commonality of like experience, as the shrinks like to say, take the advice of a non-lawyer photographer who happens to have a keyboard. They then take that advice and gamble their family fortune and their business on the advice from somebody who's never practiced law a day in their lives. The other thing, too, is anything you say on the Internet, in the chat room or uh, Facebook, wherever you are, that's all discoverable in court. That can come back to bite you, and we've seen that happen. One of the things we tell people, there's two things. We go over things not to do if you're infringed. One is don't discuss it online. Two, and it's a big one, don't contact the infringer yourself. Get legal advice. That's in the book, because, folks. <laughs> yeah, it's in the book. It's, um, it, yeah, now it's in the movie. That's in the movie. But it, it's... People do. They contact the infringer, and what happens is they hear advice on the internet. We'll charge them this, or charge them three times, or charge them six times, or charge them this or that. When it comes just as a letter from a photographer, they ignore it because they can. But what you've done is you've just painted yourself into a corner. You may send them something that you think is a lot of money, but the infringement may be the tip of the iceberg. You don't know where they're seeing it. The first thing Ed does when he sends out his famous death letter is... You, the infringer, tell us how many times you've used it, where you've used it, and how you got the image. And they're required to do that. If they don't come up with that to a lawyer, they're going to get into a lot of trouble when they get in front of a judge. If they don't disclose the full nature and extent of the usage, which they can do without it being used against them, okay, for the purposes of settlement, if they don't do that before we sue them, when I do sue them, because they haven't disclosed the full nature and extent of the use, the judge looks at them and says, Greenberg's client was trying to avoid suing you. If the image is registered, Greenberg's client is now entitled to attorney's fees from you. You've made Greenberg do a lot of work. You've made his client come down here for no reason. You could have possibly settled the case if you told Greenberg that you used it on such and such a website for such and such amount of time and for such and such a product. When a letter is sent by a photographer that says, you know, I saw it in Home Depot on Smith Street in Duluth and therefore send me uh, for $1,000. Well, the photographer is just being stupid because if it's in a Home Depot in Duluth, it's likely in a Home Depot in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, in Dallas, Texas, and Kansas City, Missouri. So until... Plus the thousand get, other Home Depots. Well, that's why <laughs> you have to get a writing right. from the, from generally speaking, the attorney of the company that says, we represent 
This is the use that we've made of it. This is the countries where we've used it. This is the media in which we've used it. And then the artist, the, whether it's an illustrator or a photographer, could sit down with the attorney and assess the value of the case. If you can settle it, great. If not, you put it into suit. But you, if I were to say to you, I have a uh, 2015 Porsche in my garage. I'll sell it to you for $1,000. Are you going to buy it? Are you going to buy it? Yeah. But you're making a face, Bob. Yeah. You're hesitating. Why are you hesitating? I'd probably take it. You would? What if I told you it's a matchbox car? <laughs> what if I told you I don't own it? What if I told you it was totaled? That's why it's I hesitated, the- guys. Right. Well, you shouldn't hesitate. The answer is you never buy a pig in a poke. Right. So for a photographer to see one infringement and assume that that's the only infringement is just plain dumb. Is it the legal term pig in a poke or is it pig and a poke? Because – Never mind. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna check that. Yeah, we'll check a that. poke is a bag. So yeah, it's, it's I check that. In a poke. In a poke. Okay. Well, I was thinking yeah. a pig and a poke would be like a really unattractive stripper kind of thing. You know what? I could. You just gave me a craving for a BLT for lunch, but that's a. <laughs> All right, moving on. Hey, Jack, <laughs> you're the photographer in this situation. How did yes. you become interested enough to to want to co-author a book about copyright? I mean, copyright uh, IP is supposed to be. Uh, anathema to, to guys like you. Well, yeah, it's left brain and right brain, but yeah. I've always been good in business. Um, actually, I started, um, I'm one of the original Canon Explorers of Light. I was uh, in that first group. And uh, very early on, they asked me to do a copyright seminar along with um, Seth Resnick and Jeff Shiwi. And Canon sent us around a couple cities. And so I said, great. And I did some research into it. And Ed, who I've known forever, um, over 30 years, um, we're in a, a weekly poker game for uh, about that long. That's how I pay the rent. Yeah, it's a it's a friendly game. It's sort of um, if you've seen the opening of the Odd Couple, uh, the original one. Um, it's sort of like that. It's it's quite an eclectic group of people. Um, but uh, it's just something I got interested in. The more I got in, and the more people started asking me questions. Even as a non-lawyer, I get calls every week um, from people I know, people who've heard me, people who whatever with uh, copyright inf- questions. Most of the time, the answer is contact a lawyer in your area, um, depending on what it is. F- f- photographers and illustrators are, uh, the cliches, woefully uneducated. Uh, if they've gone to any of the major art schools, with the exception of SVA, where Jack teaches and I lecture, uh, and we, we go up to Hallmark School of Photography next month, most of the art schools, film schools, don't teach anything about business. Most photographers come out of uh, a BA program and don't know how to write an invoice. Yeah, that's one of the things we, we stress in the book, and, and I do it. I have a graduate class. Um, it's amazing how many photographers out there who've been around for a long time and are very successful, and you look at their invoice and you go, uh oh. Um, we have, I think, nine or ten points that we emphasize that you need to have on your invoice. Uh, one of the things is because your invoice as a photographer is your license of use. Uh, and that becomes critical in some cases. Um, one of the things we say you have to have on it, um, no rights transferred or no rights given until this invoice is paid in full. Uh, basically, language like that. There's yeah, a couple different ways to say you gotta it. Remember, what the artists forget is unless you're selling a print or unless you're selling a uh, piece of sculpture, you are not selling your photos. You're licensing them. So a photographer or an illustrator is more akin to a Hertz dealership than they are to a Chevy dealership. You are giving permission to use your image in certain means and media for a certain amount of time for a certain amount of money. You retain all your rights, just like Hertz owns the car that you're renting. It's different than when you go to Walmart and buy a Samsung television. There, Walmart's a seller, Samsung's a manufacturer. You own that television set, and if you want to throw it off a cliff because uh, you know the jet's lost again, you can do that. Again? But again. Um. Not the same as when you lease or license a piece of intellectual property. Yeah, and the good thing about the car analogy is that one of the cases uh, Ed handled for me, um, suing somebody who used it on their internet site, their website to uh, sell coffee, um, I ended up with a Prius in my driveway that I paid for in cash. Nice. Um, so that was, uh, 
that's a lot of my interest in it, uh, in copyright uh, also. Plus, uh, just the way we've been doing it, and we just started sort of off the cuff, we get a lot of people telling us that we've made it interesting. One of the, the reviews we've had online of this book was somebody said, I couldn't believe that I was actually laughing out loud at reading about a book on copyright. We use lots of cartoons, and we know that most artists have attention spans of 30 to 45 seconds. <laughs> so the book is written that way. Our seminars are given that way. It's great bathroom reading. Uh, you can also keep the oh, book. Oh, you got to have a better analogy than that. Okay, you can keep it near the computer and look something up and find it and get an answer in 45 seconds uh, or less. Uh, it's the kind of book that you can bounce around and get a quick answer without relying on tribal knowledge on the web, which is nine out of ten times flat out wrong. Oh, my God. Some of the stuff is, is just unbelievable. I, I've gotten in with people online where, where they say something, and you just you try and say it in the nicest way possible, but you're completely wrong. Um, and that's not just, just average people. I've got to tell you, too, if you talk to a lawyer who's not an intellectual property lawyer, um, sometimes they don't know what they're talking about. I, I am in court, physically in court, in front of flesh and blood judges and juries uh, at least two to three times a week on copyright cases. And, and I want to and, ask you, how, how long have you been, uh, have you specialized in IP? 36 really long, long years. So, now, how long have you been practicing overall? 36. Okay, that's what I was just long, trying to get at. So this, is, this has been your thing the whole way. Oh yeah, this is this is what I do. So attorneys who call themselves litigators who maybe go into a courtroom once every five years will say things in court and I had one just the other day. A very, very common mistake that lay people make and it's excusable for a lay person, inexcusable for a lawyer. This lawyer who holds himself out as an intellectual property attorney said it in front of the judge and the judge excoriated him right away. There's that's a Wait, big word. Editorial use, excoriated, I said it right. Uh, editorial use of a photo means an image is used in connection with a news story or a story of public interest. Uh, it could be a sports story and so on, as opposed to a photo that's used on a Clairol box. And in this case, the judge said that, I'm sorry, the attorney is trying to tell the judge, well, you know, we were able to use this copyrighted image of famous person taken by Greenberg's client because it was in a news story. No. <laughs> no. If that were true, then news photographers, White House photographers, sports photographers, could never copyright any of their images because if you had an image, let's say, of, uh, of uh, I don't know, Derek Jeter, and I could steal that image if I was doing a story on sports stars, the Yankees, famous people, if I was able to use it just because I was writing an editorial piece then the photographer could never, ever protect his work. Well, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, so how is licensing, or just registration, if you will, different for, say, a wedding photographer to go to the, the one end and then versus like a freelancer who shoots rock concerts, who gets... Well, the, the process is the same. Okay, so what about the no, licensing? Different. I mean, how, like if, if I'm a photographer and I get, you know, press passes to get up close and shoot... Uh, uh, the Who, they're on, con they're on tour right now. Uh, do I, you know, c do I own those, those photos? Do I, can I license them to anywhere I want or am I limited? Do I have limited? Uh, he, there's no one size fits all answer with respect, especially to rock groups. So I do work for certain well-known rock groups where they don't care who's in the audience and what they photograph and how they use it. So long as those images are not used to sell a product or on merchandise, they don't care. Other rock groups and other venues control their venues and get photographers to sign typically onerous agreements, which sometimes mean the photographer is going to hand over all of his or her work. So every situation is different, but absent a written agreement where you're giving up your copyright, you own it. You own that copyright. You can use those images. You can use them for editorial purposes. Where many people get confused is that you may have the right as the copyright holder to use the image and license the images, let's say, to, to Time Magazine or to Rolling Stone. It doesn't mean if the members of Leonard Skinner are in that photograph that you can license that photograph to um, a uh, food company, a ribs joint, and say Leonard Skinner uh, says uh, eat Joe's ribs. 
because the members of Leonard Skinner would have a lawsuit against you. That's not a copyright lawsuit. Yeah, a lot of people get confused. Uh, they ask us questions about, can I shoot this? Can I take a picture of that? You have a fundamental right in this country to take pictures. Um, and we can get into photographing police and other things. That's a fundamental right that you have. It's in the Constitution. What? I remember reading it there. That's, well, that's not right. exactly, but... I get it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Copyright is in the Constitution. Right. So when copyright was in the Constitution before the right to the, before you had the right uh, freedom of religion before the First Amendment, Any it was the there amendment. years before the direct election of a president. It's the only right given to citizens directly in the Constitution before the Bill of Rights. Having said that, magazines and inf other infringers will tell photographers, "Well, you know, just give up your copyright." Stock agencies will say, "Give us your right to." You know, pursue your copyright, and photographers and artists and, and others say, sure. But as I was saying, and you can see why Ed gets paid by the hour, yes. um, <laughs> um, what you do with the images is where a lot of legal stuff comes in. And we have something on our blog, the copyrightzone.com, about we call it a day at the zoo. And we use the zoo as a metaphor for what to do when you're photographing in public and semi public places. Um, and generally, you may have a right to take the photos of what you're doing. But if a police officer comes to you and tells you to move on, you, you can say, you know, I have a right to take the pictures, but you shouldn't necessarily just stand your ground. You should always listen to what the police say. You, you, we, if you go to the, again, the article A Day at the Zoo, also those of you out there, if you go to the ACLU website on rights of photographers, they do a nice job as well. The bottom line is you have a right to photograph police. Mm -hmm. and by the way, an issue that no one is addressing other than us, uh, as far as I know, with the increasing use of police dash cams and body cams, the so-called citizen journalist, the cell phone imagery is becoming less and less important. Sometimes it gives a different view than what the cop's camera may show. But generally speaking, if there's any litigation, criminal or civil, the police camera is going to become the quote-unquote official version, and there's going to be less of a need by the media to get citizens' views if they have access to the police camera uh, views. And the police are making those uh, images available to the media as a way of controlling the story. And you may want to keep – you may want to start tracking that law as it's being applied in Florida by the Florida legislature. This week they decided that police cameras uh, should be – private <laughs> and not not released in all circumstances. Oh, they're going to No, 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 no. Yeah, that's that's that, that, hold on, hold on. That is not a that's not a local law. Uh that it, I shouldn't say it's not only a local law. The police in any investigation have the right and sometimes they'll get a judge to sign off on it not to release all information to the public. Anybody who's watched an episode of Law and Order or CSI knows that you don't release everything to the press. Because how else would the killer know that it was an orange knife? This is this that's is, not unusual. This is happening this week. This is this is the, it's been happening for years. It's well, not new. Well, I, I'm just making you aware of something that they're trying. They're trying to make uh, all of the videos shot with police cameras private because they say it's it's an invasion of people's privacy. But and, and people and the complaint has been, wait a minute. The idea of these cameras is to is to show what the police did and saw. And also protect the public in case something went awry. Any, any, that's a public record in any right. attempt, any attempt by a less local legislature to make the police ordinary course of business, business records of the police, private, is doomed to fail. Yeah, yeah it's, just I can't see a judge. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, listen, there's a lot of legislation going through right now that um, – uh, the legislatures just aren't really thinking about what they're doing and, and how other laws affect I can't believe it. you said that. Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> the important thing to realize with this is that these, these kinds of legislations are governed by state law. And every state can have a different law so long as none of those laws is in violation of the United States Constitution. And whether police records in the ordinary course of public record has been decided a zillion times. Nothing new. Well, th there's a couple things I want to just jump in on, too. One is if you do photograph something of uh, police action, uh, like that video of Walter Scott being shot in um, South Carolina, 
that becomes very, very valuable. And what happens is the news media is asking people, well, send us what you have. Give it away. Give it to us for free. Right. And we, what do people do? They, they do, do it. They do it. And because, you know, why? <laughs> It, you can actually get money for that, and people have. There is famous footage of things happening. I've, I personally brokered photographs, 9-11 footage, the only footage that shows both planes going into both towers at the same time. I've had other newsworthy images. Most famously, if uh, those of you in New York and are of a certain age, Lisa Steinberg was a famous child murder case, and all of the images that were used to convict her uh, adoptive father uh, came out of this office and were carefully distributed and licensed with the monies going to various children's charities. I have brokered uh, news, newsworthy film many, many times. But people who shoot the you know, uh, newsworthy images that have an immediate value are so thrilled to get it on TV that they give it away. Now on and, and then it gets, it gets um, syndicated. You send it in, and the terms of sending it in say that they now own it and can do something with it. And what they do is they, they syndicate it, it and I'm, license it to other news associates. I'm holding in my grubby little paws a document which I have just edited, which we're going to put on the uh, uh, which we're going to put on the uh, uh, blog eventually. This is from a major magazine that stole one of my clients' image uh, images and put it on the cover. And when the photographer notified the magazine that the photographer was going to be contacting me, the magazine sent this form that says, in effect, in just about so many words, we use the image, we retain the right to reproduce the cover of the magazine for any purpose in perpetuity without payment. <laughs> Sign in return. So when I got the attorney for the magazine on the phone, who's dealt with me before, I said, you know, you have the audacity to send this out. You stole it from a photographer. You put it on the cover of a major magazine, and now you want the photographer to say, yes, you took my blood. Good luck with it. Go make money in the future. This is bad enough that I'm going to publicize the hell out of it, and I am. So this is what the magazines do. For those of you out there who think that a media outlet, big or small, has any guilt about stealing your work, you're sadly mistaken. And but some of them just don't know. There was the, the one of the uh, Chup uh, Tupac Shakur shop where an editor at a newspaper said, what, you expect yeah. your photographer is going to get paid every time this iconic picture is used? And You want us to pay? You want he, the, the photographer wants to get paid when we use the picture? Are you kidding? Usually well, the, Ed the institution, the institution understands that they have to get paid, but the person on the front line who's acquiring the art and photo, sometimes they just... Not anymore. Yeah, well, no, the world is the world has yeah. changed. Twenty years ago, the world has changed dramatically. Twenty years ago, a news media uh, outlet would have people who had been in the business for 15, 25, 30 years who were experienced photo editors and experienced editors. Many of the major blogs that you uh, all know uh, well get millions of hits per month have no photo editors. They have nobody over the age of 21. They have nobody checking on no whether there's checking. rights or permissions. There's no fact checking going on because anybody could turn out a blog by simply owning a keyboard. So there are no gatekeepers to any of this information. For Ed Greenberg and more particularly for Ed Greenberg's wife, it's a source of income that Jack, didn't really exist 25 years ago. Jack, does he it always is. speak in the third person? I've noticed a lot of that here today. Third person. I very rarely speak in the third person. This is a, an appropriate one. But don't assume that people at magazines or networks know what they're doing. They don't. Yeah. Don't forget the people with 20 years experience get paid more than a 22-year-old with no experience. And, and a lot of this is confusing. You sort of have to be a specialist in, in this field to a degree. I got a, you didn't see it, but I got an email from somebody I know uh, who I've been going back and forth with. They said uh, they have in their state a, a very prominent IP lawyer who told them that they couldn't register um, his published images because registering unpublished and published are two different things. Um, it's a little harder to do the published images. We recommend you register everything before it's published. And published means presented to the public. So if you put it on your website, 
that's presented to the public. That's considered published. So he had a lot of stuff that's been published on his website he wants to register. This IP attorney told him, you have to give the date of, re of publication for each so you can only do one at a time. That's not true. Um, where unpublished, I can do 10,000, 13,000. If you're doing published images, if you're registering, you have to go into what they call the pilot program for your first two or three registrations and it's limited to 300 at that time. They just want to make sure that you're labeling everything correct. The lawyer sort of had it right in that your title in the published works have to say when it was published and have some other information. So for those of you out there uh, who are of a certain age and even have analog images and may have been shooting for 20, 30, or 40 years and have a gazillion images, you can register images that you shot in the 50s, 60s, 80s, 90s, you can. You are likely to be selecting them with somewhat more care than if next week you go uh, to Disney World uh, and shoot a thousand images, in which case you're going to register all of them for a $55 fee. Yeah, one of my students uh, at SCA who's been doing fantastic in fine art has been photographing around uh, Coney Island and different places of Brooklyn where he grew up. And a lot of the images that he shot just two, three, four years ago, the buildings don't exist anymore or something else has been added. So his view now at the time just looked like, oh, it's a picture of this building, it's cute. Well, now it's valuable because that view doesn't exist we, anymore. I have a series of books in here, uh, Lost Las Vegas, Lost New York. Uh, where there are blocks of real estate that, especially in Las Vegas, anybody who knows Vegas knows it changes every, uh, every Thursday. Yeah, because people Tho lost a lot right. in Las Vegas, too. Right. Those images become valuable because they can't be recreated. One of my clients took a very famous image of a no-nukes rally uh, while they were building the World Trade Center, and there were about 300,000 people in lower Manhattan. And that image obviously can't be recreated and became extremely valuable for historical and other purposes. So What the, about the bar uh, that showed up on a Broadway show? Oh, well, we, one of our lawsuits on. was against the Broadway musical Fela, uh, where they used our client's image as, in effect, the set. It was projected uh, and used as a set. And the bar that Fela became famous uh, for performing at no longer existed, and this was essentially the only photo that was suitable. Uh, and that was used in a Broadway show. Yeah, and if you saw the image originally, you'd say, no, it's yeah. a nice picture of the front of a building. But now, because of history and time and other things, and the fact that it doesn't exist anymore, it's become very valuable. That's why we tell people, just register everything. I don't, um, people say, well, you know, I need to edit it down. And, and I say, you know, when I come back from a trip, I just register everything before I edit it. And this is important, too, in a digital age. Um, I register it before I work on the image. You know, I'm, I'm going to work on the image in Photoshop or Lightroom. I'm going to increase the contrast, the saturation. I'm going to, you know, change some of the values. That doesn't matter. That's now a derivative of my original registration. Um, I don't have to re-register it after I've worked on that image. Or if I take a piece from one image and put it into another, those are derivatives of my original registration. So I'm still fully covered. All right. Well, folks, listen. Uh, you can order Ed Greenberg and Jack Rosnicki's book, The Copyright Zone, A Legal Guide for Photographers and Artists in the Digital Age, from great retailers everywhere. Or you can get it right now at a great price right here from MrMedia.com. If you're watching the show on MrMedia.com, uh, either to the left or right under the video, you will see a copy of the book cover. Yep. That's it, Jack. You'll see it. Um, you, can, you can click on it now. My understanding is that uh, Amazon can get it to you via drone in about 30 minutes or less. Or you can uh, – you, uh, guys, I don't remember. Is it a, available as an ebook? Yes. Uh, yes, it is. Okay, yes. So you can download the ebook. Uh, maybe it'll take you two days to get it from Amazon. I don't know. Um, and uh, they, the guys mentioned their website, thecopyrightzone.com, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. And are you guys on uh, Twitter, Facebook? Can people find you on social media as well? Yes, there's a Copyright Zone um, Facebook, and um, I'm on Twitter as Copyright Jack um, on occasion. But uh, mostly we do everything on our blog site. Okay. And speaking of, of visual trickery, uh, folks, you, if, you, if you go back through this video, you'll notice that at different times, uh, Jack and Ed seem to be different, very different heights. 
Good. We are. Take, take, it's very interesting. Oh, we are. At one point, uh, Jack's up here. At one point, he's down here. Ed's the same height. They're same, it's very interesting. That's so our wives can tell us apart. <laughs> Is that the only way? That's it. No, well, they feel in the dark. They go, I'm the one, I'm the one <laughs> <laughs> he's tall, has hair. I'm short and bald. He's got a Prius, and I have a 1968 Mercury Cougar XR7. So we bring that out to sh- to to kind of emphasize the fact <laughs> that we look at the same things from two different views, kind of uh, like a car talk uh, kind of uh, uh, ethos. Yeah, when we're in our lectures, sometimes there are issues we don't agree on. I mean, Ed has to give a legal point of view. And sometimes as a photographer and a business person, I have a different take on it. There's certain things where I'll take a calculated risk in my business knowing what uh, the consequences are. Knowing no attorney is ever going to tell a client to take that kind of a risk. Even though as an attorney doing this for a long time, I know that it, there's a financial gamble that a photographer or an illustrator may make, and it may be a prudent gamble. Okay. But an employer is not going to kosher that and say, Go ahead, break the law, even though your odds are getting, you know, because your odds are getting caught are only one in a thousand. He's not going to kosher it, and he's not going to Sharia it either, folks. No. Um, okay. Uh, Ed Greenberg, Jack Resnicki, thank you both very much. A fascinating conversation, as I knew it would be. And thank you both so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. It was a good, nice being here. It was a pleasure being here. Tell me who's who so I can I can mark it properly. I'm Jack. Greenberg, okay. comma, Edward. Do you have the photographer's <laughs> shirt on so you can tell? Typical typical lawyers. Chachkas. Where's where's so lots much? of chachkas. Oh You know I... this guy? You know my associate? <laughs> yeah. Hey Saul. Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Weekday mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com, the George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. This is Snake. Do you read me, Otacon? Loud and clear, Snake. Did you listen to the latest episode of the Gaming Marathon on the Realm Network? Of course. They really know their stuff about gaming, especially that Usid guy. Yeah, but that Chirac guy is a real jerk. I don't like him. Regardless, the reviews are spot on and they tell it like it is. That's for sure. What what happened, Snake? Were you spotted? Nah, it's just Lil Melser crying about the O's again. Uh, whew. Close call. I better continue the search for Metal Gear, but keep listening to the Gaming Marathon each week. You got it, Snake. New every Monday afternoon right here on the Realm Network. It's the Mark and Lowell 
Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said that they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. And what you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WAVA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. And just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. The system is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.